Hello everyone, today we talk about Seleucid cataphracts, a topic that probably many of you are kind of interested in um, because of the, let's say, of the spectacular side of the story, but actually um, besides the appearance that are definitely uh, terrifying as they were supposed to be, there is also much more in terms of um, political and military organization of the Seleucid army um, at this point. Um, I would say before starting that Seleucid cataphracts are a very particular um, experiment, it's a very successful one in the history of Hellenistic warfare of the successor states um, because essentially, albeit there were other cataphract units in, in the sense of, let's say, uh, in fact, heavily armored, fully armored uh, cavalrymen at this point, the Seleucids were the only ones that were effectively able to, among the successor states, to effectively create uh, a large corps of this uh, heavy cavalrymen and to uh, integrate it in, into their armored forces, obtaining pretty astonishing results. And this is not really something easy to do because these troops have a huge cost. Mm? Um, and, and and really the, the, the Seleucid ability to field these troops and to make them work on the long run uh, is definitely remarkable and never underestimate what costs mean in here um, these are big empires, the Seleucid one of course among the successor states is the largest one, the most powerful and the one in fact in which you see uh, a military that is essentially the one that continues the most the Alexandrine tradition, that is something you don't find on that specific philosophy um, for example, it, not even in Macedon, like Macedon has interesting changes that evolve towards uh, kind of a different direction, so it doesn't mean that we're better or worse, actually, and I made some videos on Antigonid um, armies, um, but let's say the Seleucids are the ones that make uh, functioning the most the phalanx, that is also something extremely expensive, um, I, I, I can't discuss this now, but let's say the uh, just for producing, I don't know if you're aware of this or how the, the, the we think, for example, just the Sarisai were, were built, like just the pikes. It was something I enormously expensive. Uh, it took a lot just to compare those uh, physical characteristics to, to the pike, not to break, um, uh, etc., to be welded effectively, um, and so on. And you can imagine definitely a, a large force, sometimes of thousands of cataphracts, um, uh, meant as both um, cavalrymen and, and horses, by today we will see that mm, we uh, we don't have the, the, the certainty actually and we, we also have a reasonable doubt uh, about the, the uh, complete um, cataphractness, let's say the complete degree of full, uh, the full armored um, character of these units, because effectively many of them were probably kind of a halfway between the two, that were, we don't, we know very few of how even armor was built practically, so uh, before f starting it's also very important to remind that when we talk about Hellenistic armies, we don't really know much, right? So you, you, if you mostly, most of what we know, really, but not just about Hellenistic armies, is largely conjectural. We don't have specific evidence, quantitative uh, dimensions, etc. The same goes for the Roman army. Lots of people believe that we know everything about the Roman army. We, we know basically nothing about the Roman army, of what we would like to know, at least. Well, we're lucky enough, of course, to know a lot of things. But even the essentials, like the were how they were actually deployed, how they, they actually fought, we, we don't know it. it there, there are hypotheses, some of which are better than others, but they remain as such because the amount of evidence is incredibly scarce. So in the case of Seleucid cataphracts in particular, we have, um, of course, certain models of comparisons that go from the Parthian cataphracts um, yeah, to eventually the later one of the, the Sarmatians uh, and so on. So it's a certain, sometimes contemporary evidence, other uh, later um, one, but always bearing in mind that there is um, a progressive evolution even in, in fact, the development of such military technologies, of certain uh, armor types, and always bearing in mind though that this is mostly a consequence of m more broadly political and social changes rather than strictly military ones, Th the latter which are fundamentally and largely the, just the consequence, right? So this is obviously 
always very important to, to bear in mind. So talking about cataphracts proper, a um, little, um, let's say, terminological um, explanation. When we use the term cataphract, uh, there is a lot of confusion out there because this term is often applied um, as if it was a kind of scientific category, um, which is really not. You, you can't really study ancient, medieval, or even large parts of, of modern age or some even contemporary ones, telling the truth, um, w by thinking that these names actually m m mean scientific categorizations, that they were thought and written in historical accounts as such. Mm? Um, the, the, the ancient mindset in this, mm, uh, in this moment, uh, by it very vibrant, especially in certain uh, historiographies like the Hellenistic ones, etc., is still very, you know... Um, you know, generalistic I, I, in terms of, of of terminology, it's kind of approximate, right? And it is normal because actually it's not a limit. It's uh, it's very important to give a broader amount of semantic shades that a scientific categorization, in fact, lacks because um, it makes you f fit into a quite a, an inflexible box that you you have always to to reshape in a word or another to to define what what the reality is so the term cataphract in itself probably note comes from ancient greek and it simply means it literally means armored right so when you read cataphract in general it could be many things right not always uh, the cataphract is a fully armored um cavalryman uh, or not, not, not even the horse has to be necessarily um, cataphract. It's, however, um, the, the this picture of let's say uh, both horse and horseman as um, uh, complete, fully armored, is the general sense that we tend to give today when talking about this type of troops. But it could apply really to anyone theoretically who had some form of armor. So this makes it a bit. Com conf um, you know, it can confuse you uh, or disorient you with, at the beginning, but um, it's it's like saying, I don't know, the cuirassier, right? Um, writers of this, uh, historians of this time, mean right cataphract, essentially to, to define that. I mean, troops that will, were heavily armored, sometimes fully armored, but they rarely specify this. Um, and that uh, had, in this sense, a major and, and, and evident microscopical um, role and um, I can't say technical specialization, but even function on the battlefield as ultra heavy shock cavalry. And as we, we, I was saying before, um, this was very, um, you know, this term as it was used probably had this evident meaning in, in those time mindset simply because the, the largest amount, I mean, the larger amount of troops was barely armored, right? Most of troops of the ancient world w w wasn't practically armored, aside from maybe a helmet and and some leather, uh, let's say some, some organic um, armor, but uh, it wasn't really um, uh, normal in the first place to be able to field uh, armored troops in terms of metal armor, because that was uh, paradigmatically elite. Right. So when you look at uh, militaries like the Seleucid ones uh, in this context, you have to think of an enormous power that could field uh, what normally not even a medium-sized power could could dream um, to do, especially in terms of quantity, because it's obvious that every power had its own, let's say, armored and see in this sense even cataphract elite. Right. But fielding several thousand of of, of this cavalrymen equated to have a huge empire, like in fact the Seleucid one had. Mm. It's really a matter of resources. Some successor states actually didn't have the territorial control necessary to field in terms of uh, backing resources. Um, even the phalanx, if you look, look, look at uh, some powers like the Italians, for example, they, they were too that they ruled over too small uh, land for to to make the thing work because either you have many of these troops or either it doesn't work even uh, Ptolemaic Egypt kind of undergoes but also for other reasons this sort of uh, we call it reforms but it's actually the same military that, that changes by itself by certain pol say 
um, demographic ratios and also other other dynamics uh, it's face um, and even the Seleucid army indeed uh, undergoes to from the beginning of the second century BC a decline for which eventually the Seleucids that had this empire to stretch from the Aegean Sea up to the Far East in, uh, in regions like Gedrosia or even theoretically up to um, the India um, is reduced to to Syria right the core Units, uh, excuse me, the, the core lands of the empire this time are fundamentally Syria and Mesopotamia. We'll see also Media here why it is important. And in this sense, in order to understand the Seleucid military, you have to to locate it geographically speaking. Also, in, in order to understand which kind of military influences it uh, it got from, um, it it got, and um, and uh, and from whom, of course. Um, this is particularly important because in in the dreams of Alexander, probably there was a, a, a fusion in, in many ways between the Hellenistic um, way of war that the, the, the Macedons had mastered at this point in its most evoluted uh, fashion, and this other uh, Eastern, let's call it them in this way, uh, military traditions. Right, this never quite fully happened like there was never in the Hellenistic world the um, the complete fusion uh, of uh, let's say from a military point of view of, of different military philosophies at the point that you could say that I don't know there were regular for example horse archers into the Seleucid army it was always about the phalanx uh, it was however um, true that there was the uh, ad uh, adoption of this new type of heavier cavalry that also appears relatively late in terms of um, relatively to Seleucid history that in fact seems to have been uh, a, a direct uh, result of the contact of the Seleucids with this Iranic pastoral populations of the uh, Iranian plateau that uh, that definitely had this kind of um, kind of uh, of troops as uh, you know traditionally speaking because of their quasi feudal um, political and social organization mostly the Parthians but also this other you know group of peoples that were definitely pretty mixed uh, at the time coming from the steppes right another point that I would like to make. Um, um, is that essentially our knowledge of Seleucid military is uh, revived under the reign of Antiochus the third that between the that, that, that in fact was between the end of the third and the the beginning of the second century uh, BC that in fact is considered as the megas you know one of the greatest uh, generals of the ancient world, uh, about whom, in fact, we know very few, uh, and also thanks to the fact that he, uh, I mean, we kn what we know is also thanks to the fact that that he, uh, as we all know, fought against the Romans, um, and so uh, eventually that branch, that the, the Roman perspective, lived on to remember this. Um, also, since contemporary times, but um, otherwise, we know very few about the Seleucid military in general like the, the third century is largely like we, we know almost nothing right so w with Antiochus the third we observe this revival w what happened before we don't really know however there is a general consensus that Antiochus um, re not of, of course gave um, further strength to, to the empire and in this sense also uh, started this sort of military reforms that definitely made the Seleucid army one of the most uh, advanced and sophisticated uh, military machines um, of the ancient world uh, at that point. I'm a great, uh, I must say, I'm a great, uh, can, I, I hate to say that I'm a fan of, the <laughs> of, of anyone in history, but really, uh, Seleucid, um, I mean, in terms at least of, of, of how much th this is known in popular culture, really, Seleucid Empire is a pretty important thing that happened historically. And uh, it's not that we care very much about it, but it's very, very fascinating, important to know, right? So, um, and uh, further thoughts they touched on before is that the Seleucid army, um, in this sense, however, never quite lost the the Alexandrine uh, military uh, system in uh, 
as a military philosophy, let's say, uh, so that the introduction of this uh, Eastern influence is never actually um, uh, affected the the core of of the Seleucid military system, that as we have said before was supplied by you know a, a large amount of resources. It was sufficient to to um, to make it work functionally, right? So the Seleucids were were in this sense traditionalist in the measure in which they were able to replicate the Alexandrine phalanx, um, the Macedonian phalanx, over and over. Um, and, and this is a proof of some sort of, of however strong and um, and happy um, integration also of other, uh, of, of say, of local elements I in the empire. I made a video about, uh, it was something like Syrians, Mesopotamians and Persians in the Seleucid army. The deal's exactly like that. It shows you basically how um, the, the Seleucids managed to um, to engage uh, over time in this local um, military colonies, uh, veteran colonies, um, the, the local population and to uh, perpetrate fundamentally this military organization over the centuries in this territory that, as we said before, was very wide. So it was definitely a very, uh, a very uh, effective, um, uh, a very good result and uh, it's fundamentally just because the Seleucid Empire was defeated by Rome that this thing started to crumble. But let's say in terms especially of the core lands of the empire between Syria and Mesopotamia and partly of Media, uh, as we will see now that you know the things worked pretty pretty well. And it was amazing for an empire at the time to even be able to control these areas. Why the reason is that naturally uh, Syria and Mesopotamia were some of the most advanced um, regions of the ancient world, Mesopotamia uh, in particular that in this sense was also relatively far from uh, big uh, empires at that very point. Syria instead were the, the, the capital from Seleucia was uh, in Mesopotamia was shifted to Antioch, was a bit more on the frontier, uh, it was on the Mediterranean, there were the Ptolemies in the south, um, this land in the middle also with uh, in um, with with the Jews inhabiting it and therefore having this ability to uh, even make some sort of proxy war depending on uh, trying to stem in Egypt and also uh, ha having um, fundamentally an access to Anatolia that was not also uh, was pretty fragmented um, in some ways the Italians managed to to create some power in there but fundamentally the Seleucids are able to recover it when they eventually invade Greece and they um, they enter in contact uh, with the Romans. So um, finally talking about the cataphracts. So first of all how did this military um, tradition of heavily armed or fully armored uh, horsemen um, started? Well Fundamentally, it's believed that this combat style originated in Central Asia, as we know that, uh, I mean, it's not believed, we, we are basically know, and that, but we think that it was introduced in this sense as a, the, the result um, of uh, Antiochus III Anabasis between 210 and 206 BC, that it was basically the, the reconquest of these um, Iranian um, uh, these Persian lands that had in, in the Far East kind of escaped um, the control, the central control of, of, of the empire. Um, and therefore, the cataphrag, the, this is the, the main hypothesis, right? It kind of makes sense because basically we will see that the first um, evidence of uh, Seleucid cataphracts is in the uh, 200 BC Battle of Panium, so just a few years after the victorious. Um, Antiochus III's Anabasis had uh, had taken place. Um, I wouldn't like to to explain now why, because it would take some time to why cataphracts originated in Central Asia. Uh, however, let's be simply um, direct and uh, say that there there hadn't been in the Near East fundamentally. The Near East actually was. Um, was uh, crossed um, by uh, many armies of of horse riding peoples from from the Eurasian steppes since uh, 
since millennia at this point, really. So um, it was a, an area that actually knew about these military traditions and had uh, seen a substantial deal of the development also of cavalry traditions, especially in the, um, let's say, in the mountains, in the plateaus of, of Iran, and partly also of the Caucasus, and also Anatolia, telling the truth, of really heavily armored uh, cavalry. These areas are all close to the Eurasian steppes, and partly they, they were directly influenced by this tradition, but let's say that there had never been a really a Near Eastern power that had managed to field um, fully um, armored cavalry like uh, the Seleucids would first do, like the, the Achaemenids, the, the Persian Empire had <coughs> its own uh, heavy cavalry, I even made a video about that, but it was never the full cataphract, right? There were probably some um, cataphracts that served at some point, but we don't really know. During, the, in fact, the Achaemenid um, times, uh, in, in, the, in the Persian military, um, and uh, that, however, were in some contained number, but also in here, um, cataphract, the combat style was kind of evolving, right? So th there is a progress, especially in these last years uh, before Christ, and, and even beyond, actually, that were especially in Central Asia and regions like Bactria and, and uh, the, the, this, the Afghanistan, this, this, um, uh, the... This, th there was a kind of a happening, uh, awakening of cavalry and the uh, consequential uh, fielding of of heavier and heavier cataphracts, right? And this is a tradition that those areas really maintained over time. Um, and also in here we can't expand too much on that because it's not really the focus of our video. But let's say that as you understand, also geographically speaking, the Seleucid Empire that had come to rule on these uh, uh, areas um, was mm, eligible, <laughs> let's say, to be the next power to be influenced uh, influenced by this surrounding uh, peoples in terms of military tradition. So um, today we effectively credit uh, the Antiochus the uh, Third Anabasis or Anabasis, better, um, to have been the, the direct link. Right, uh, the Seleucids went fighting against these populations that had occupied the um, Iranian plateau, and they they did use this uh, this uh, cataphracts. They were the Parthians, after all, the ones that had uh, effectively in in this uh, near and Middle Eastern um, area the the heavier cataphracts eventually, um, because they settled there and they replicated it. Um, I've discussed also in here already how Persian cataphracts developed over time. I also have some questions that I, w I will probably answer in my next uh, question and answer video, because the thing is sometimes very sinusoidal in its uh, development. It wasn't like a straight line uh, or a straight trend. There were ups and downs, also depending on the, the stories that, that of, of this area. Um, however, for what it concerns the uh, Seleucids, the integration of cataphracts, or the imitation of cataphracts, better, um, was uh, a brilliant success. Mm -hmm. um, at the Battle of Panion in 200 BC, the Seleucid cataphracts um, quickly defeated the Ptolemaic heavy horsemen that were facing them in, in, in the enemy, uh, you know, in, in the deployment information, and uh, eventually the same cataphracts attacked the Ptolemaic phalanx from the rear. Mm. Um, so that was a, a remarkable success. What is very important about this, so it tells us already something, but we will look at the Battle of Panion a bit uh, more in, in depth later, but already in here the fact that uh, a fully, or almost fully, cataphract cavalry could um, defeat um, other heavy cavalry. It's kind of normal, but it's not normal that um, such cavalry could even kind of reform, obviously, after this clash in managing to to attack properly the, the enemy phalanx from, from the rear, right? Uh, 
Um, it is true that the phalanx normally, when it was flanked, it immediately routed. I mean, it didn't even wait for 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 entering contact with the enemy once they lost their flank. But it seemingly that was not, or at least it was not necessarily um, the case. I, I, in any case, however, for an altar heavy cavalry, the real problem is you know, exhaustion, like the, 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 the both the horses, now there were a, a particular breed that was kind of, um, not necessarily designed, but definitely suited for this, uh, for bearing all that weight uh, of of the armored and of, of the armored horsemen, um, uh, that, that could reform, you know, that, that could launch a charge and basically still having the this force, the strength to, to go on to reorder, um, uh, to line up once again and leading another charge, right? Um, this is normally, you know, th th in, in the ancient world there have been, uh, even if you look at the battle of, of Kanai, for example, you find Numidian cavalry d performing even three charges, but that was kind of light cavalry, so even if those were some of the finest uh, cavalry men that were, still they weren't so heavily uh, hampered by their weight, right? So. This the, at the Battle of Panion, especially the the the, Sel the, the cataphract, Seleucid cataphract performance is is astonishing, and and if it is true really that the the, the Seleucids had adopted this combat style from just a few years, well, definitely it was one of the most um, uh, astonishing results of um, effective military in integration um, of of a combat style. Um, ever uh, registered and um, it's also important to understand in here that very likely these were not um, actual Parthian cataphracts I mean these weren't very likely the Seleucids taking I don't know Parthian cataphracts together with them also because here there are some problems because that would have been the elite of a kingdom fundamentally you, you don't bring it so easily in there um, but these were actually Seleucids replicating Parthian cataphracts, um, which is even more important because it shows you that th this is probably one of the greatest achievements, really, of uh, Hellenistic warfare in terms of of, of uh, integration and application of of a combat style. Um, and, and and definitely Antiochus the third was one of the greatest commanders, and uh, one of the most talented ones of of the ancient world. So we can't expect him to have really achieved this thanks to his his extraordinary extraordinary uh, qualities um, and it seems that after the uh, victory of Panion uh, the Seleucids decided to um, equip um, and train most of the um, let's say um, mounted contingents in, in the in the standing army of the Seleucids, so not the national contingents from foreign populations of tribal populations, into cataphract fashion, right? So this is also very important because it's as if really all the um, the core units of uh, Seleucid cavalry were transformed into cataphracts, with some exception that we will see now, but. This also means that you have actually a lot of resources in order to perform that. It, it's not really, it's not really a few. But uh, this speaks for also for the effectiveness of this combat style that the Seleucids had tested. And believe me, these things really do not happen um, casually, right? Normally, armies do evolve. Um, uh, by themselves, um, and surely what happened during Antiochus the Third and Abbasis, uh, which we don't really know in detail, might have made uh, you know th th those um, th that campaign a very um, effective uh, testing ground to uh, to adopt this, this combat style and to and to um, uh, let's say observe where it was feasible fundamentally to, to integrate it into your armed forces but in, in fact this is this goes beyond right and it corresponds to uh, uh, what it seems a very um, a very direct and, ex and expressed and uh, an explicit uh, design uh, 
to restructure the Seleucid cavalry in this case, but in this sense a, a, a fundamental element of the army in, in a different fashion that was naturally to uh, cooperate with the, the phalanx that was really the real bulk of the of the Seleucid army uh, in general, right? You know that essentially Hellenistic armies uh, at this point, or at least those who are able to field um, an actual um, pike band uh, phalanx are um, are um, are using the, the phalanx as this um, relatively you know static um, anvil and then operating uh, on the flanks with uh, the the hammer like the, the was heavy cavalry the Macedonians had naturally their uh, quasi feudal uh, cavalry uh, tradition that had been uh, one of the the most advanced in uh, in the, in the ancient world, definitely, I think, rightfully, the, the heaviest cavalry ever fielded up to that point into Western Europe um, by a local a local power. So, the it's very interesting to to read um, the 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 heavening, the wagoning of Seleucid cavalry at this point in history. Like it is more than one century after Alexander. Um, into a sense that was fundamentally implementing the the concept of the hammer, right? And that was to be understood like, in fact, uh, an arm that had necessarily to cooperate with the phalanx, but in th still in this traditional sense. And in fact, the Seleucid army, um, um, you know, uh, as you know, eventually what it was defeated by the Romans. I had my uh, let's say my share of experience um, a bit. I I, I wrote uh, something about uh, the in fact the the vexata quaestio of the of manipular religion versus Macedonian phalanx. Basically, studied all the battles that involved this um, this clash, and I have my op own opinions on this that are. Uh, relatively contrarian, at least to, to to what you hear most of the times around, and the, the, I, my my take on this is that, that there have always to be made a lot of distinctions um, when we talk about these topics because it's never so easy as it's somehow uh, depicted. The the point I'm trying to make is that actually the, the this military. Is that there is a sort of revival that happens just before, in fact, the Roman conquests uh, in the Hellenistic world that you can observe in several lands, like in Antigone, in Macedon, partly also in the Achaean League. Um, I, I think I made a video even on the uh, Spartan army. Um, and definitely the Seleucid Empire is basically the brightest example of this. There is something even in the Ptolemaic Kingdom happening in the same way of... Um, a military system, say Ptolemaic kingdoms, maybe not excessively, but it took another turn, eventually followed kind of the Roman path, which also the, the Celsius did when they lost their core lands, they couldn't feel a uh, large phalanx anymore. But this is another chapter, another of the story. Um, but let's say that um, this system was probably, it was not really... Um, uh, dying out, it wasn't really uh, it hadn't really become sclerotic. Um, it still h had a lot to offer, and it, and even if you um, you know if you look at the the ultimate outcome, it's not that the Roman victory is it, it's a victory. I I can't deny it. Also, I love Roman warfare, as you know. I made a lot of videos about that, and I. I must say I like the Romans more <laughs> than I like the Seleucids, but I always like to take also the the other side uh, perspective because objectively it, it's it's not very distant from a draw at the end of the day, and and there are also lots of things that, that do go wrong. And after all, these encounters weren't that many. I mean, there isn't this. Ma in fact, there is this massive evidence that uh, the phalanx was somewhat an inferior system to the Roman legion. Also because we don't know much, especially about the phalanx, but not even about the Roman legion at this point. Um, and, um, and also there is a, a literature that, I'm, 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 I'm Polybius, I'm, I'm looking at you, yes, that is, um, that is definitely exceptional and, and talks about these things, and it does make sense um, 
but um, it's a bit positivistically oriented. Like it's not a surprise that Polybius had a great fortune also back in the 19th century because of this kind of positivistic, in part pos positivistic approach to certain explanations. Um, also in here there would be a lot to say in terms of um, ac the actual r reliability of, of Polybius himself that has been uh, exaggerated. Like. Uh, unfortunately, because Polybius is often depicted as the guy, oh, well, he, this was a military uh, advisor, he even went to Egypt for forming the, the Ptolemaic military or something like that. Well, it wasn't really like that. The, um, my take is that he actually never saw, for example, a, a Roman legion and a um, Macedonian funks actually fighting. Uh, it, it's very easy to understand, especially if you read from the original text, but even if you read it in translation, you can already understand there is much of ideal in what he's writing. But aside from this, um, that this is really another story, and believe me, I, I will be talking f literally for days <laughs> about this. Many other videos, so I promise. I if I, you know, if I leave enough, <laughs> that I won't let you down on this because it's really one of my most. Uh, I'm very passionate about this, in spite of I'm a, I am a medievalist, but th this is a part of military history that never never stays away of my interests because it's really it's really fascinating and very complex and very complicated also. Um, so going back to Seleucid cataphracts, um, we must uh, admit that basically the precise equipment um, and combat method of, of the Seleucid cataphracts is not very is not well known, right? As we were saying before, uh, we have a very scarce and um, sometimes even brief, I don't know how to say that, um, evidence or references to, um, uh, to, to, the, to the cataphracts, um, to the cataphracts in general, right, e even about the Parthian ones, even later ones, it's not that we know this excessive much, right, and definitely in the Seleucid case uh, also a few. The only real information on Seleucid cataphracts equipment appears in uh, Livy's description of the deployment of the Seleucid army at the Battle of Magnesia, or Magnesia, Magnesia if you prefer, 190 BC. We will also look at, at that a uh, bit more in detail later. Um, basically, Livy um, mentions the cataphracts. Um, without further specificities, and then he states that next to them, next to the cataphracts, were uh, the horsemen of the Regia Ala, that in Latin is basically the royal wing, that um, is w it was one of the royal guard units, basically, who, according to him, um, were equipped as horsemen with lighter armor for themselves and their horses. This is Levy 37, 40, 12, if you want the, the reference. So, um, basically, um, what the, the statement is that both of the men and the horses of the cataphracts are meant in here to be rather heavily armored, uh, as, a, as a logical consequence. Um, we have some, um, say, illustrative material that it, it, it indicates... Um, some increase, considerable increase, for example, in the length of the offensive weapon of the cataphracts, main weapon. Um, and it seems that this um, trend um, persisted in the new cavalry combat style as well. Um, so on the base of this, um, it's possible to make some conclusion to by using certain general information that we have from pictorial and literary sources on cataphracts. Um, comparing uh, especially this um, evidence of the 1st to the 3rd century AD where the cataphracts had mostly their 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 height, right? Um, because even in the Parthian, uh, from the Parthian side it was definitely the the most, um, you know, the one that, that in fact was the spring of, the, of this combat style for, for the Seleucids. Um, the, the cataphracts, excuse me, the, the Parthians tend to um, 
first of all, in the third century, that they're they are Sassids, they're substituted by the, the Sassanids. And what happens to their cavalry is that they really, uh, they don't abandon cataphracts, but they tend to abandon the fully armored one. So actually, between the fourth, let's say, the, the third and fourth century, the, also the Persians tend to abandon fully armored cataphract and they, they have kind of a s sort of half armored cataphract. This is also very important and should be observed in evolutionary perspective because it means something about also how they, these troops were were employed like I on the field together with other units but we will discuss this hopefully in another video. Um, but there is one point to bear in mind in here uh, and naturally, not just uh, Parthian cataphracts, but also the ones that the Romans meet, basically in the in the Eurasian, uh, like the Sarmatians, basically. Um, there also are, especially the Alani tribe, uh, that was the that came in fact with fr <coughs> excuse me from far east, so they were the ones who were closer to the, s the Central Asian spring of this source of this combat style. Um, but there is always to bear in mind one thing that is basically what I was telling about the uh, before about the non scientific um, categorization that the term cataphract means. It's basically is that cataphracts had actually a very wide um, and different degree of um, armor, helmets form, and equipment in general. Right, so um, we don't have to think of these cataphracts like a, a one model that was basically imitated throughout all um, the, the centuries in the same exact way, with the same exact military technology, with the, the, the same uh, um, the same equipment, the same type of armor, for example. There were many variations, right? Always bearing in mind, that especially in those. Um, let's say non statual contexts, most of these troops came from kind of local lords that had also a degree of personalization, customization in general, equipment was not standardized. It's mostly the core concept of the heavily armored cavalrymen uh, that that is the concept. We will see that some cataphracts, for example, didn't have armor for their horses, right, which is normally uh, something you say, well, but then they weren't cataphracts. That's because we can't take scientific this this the term cataphract as a scientific categorization, right? And th there was that as well. So yes, it, it's that broad, it's that, and especially it's uncertain, it's complicated. That there is no sound evidence of how the typical cataphract could be. And different peoples had different traditions and different ways of fighting and different uh, access to various resources and so on. So actually, um, catafra Hellenistic cataphracts, like in this case, differed from, say, this uh, Eurasian steppes um, cataphracts. But also, they also th they varied a lot within themselves. Mm. So. Yes, and and I, I also add that in fact after the um, the collapse of the Seleucid Empire in the Hellenistic tradition, there wasn't basically any other large amount of cataphracts being fielded, hmm, like it had been in this case. It was at that point all about these populations like the Parthians or the Sarmatians. Uh, of course, from what you know, from from a Western perspective then of course in Central Asia a lot of other things were, were happening so obviously but we're not talking about them so another important uh, note is to understand that the unique aspect of the cataphracts as their same na name indicates was their defensive equipment right the the ratio like the, the, the of the cataphract was not uh, the um, let's say the shock eff effect as much as the defensive effect, right? It, the the idea is that this heavier cavalry naturally develops to charge, but its 
defensive equipment is mostly developed because of protection. Mm? Um, especially considering that these troops basically emer emerge from a military context that was full of arrow fire, right? And as you know, uh, cavalry is a pretty damn uh, good target for <laughs> every time a projectile. So that had brought on the long run for those who could definitely afford that type of, of, of equipment mostly the, the highest form of defense that it came partly as a cause but mostly as a consequence to to become also heavy uh, shock cavalry right and always remember that uh, as it happens in many uh, al al almost all the time basically in military history the heaviest type of cavalry doesn't quite have uh, doesn't have its greatest effect from from a physical point of view rather from a psychological point of view if you, you know, if you look for example how the battle of Karai was actually fought you realize that um the it was really a combined tactic about basically targeting the enemy with arrows and then therefore making them spread try to avoid being hit like a compact mass then making the cataphracts approach and therefore making the the mass to to recompact and then to throw uh, arrows once again to make them spread and to basically have this uh, even in physical making this physical damage on the enemy but mostly the psychological one in tiring him and exhausting him and disrupting his uh, order and softening up its ranks so most of the times this cavalry didn't even need to to charge physically uh, i mean to to let's say to to impact with um with uh in with solid formations in the end but simply to run over people who were basically already fleeing and butchering them down and most of this was done actually and also most of the pursuit especially by lighter cavalry so um and the the word definitely measures to counter to counter cataphracts the romans <laughs> kind of became specialized into that when on, on their eastern frontier I even made a video on uh, i think it was persian i don't remember it was persian war for something like that. you know this was a time in history which cavalry as heavy as it could be like in this case however was not still the um the decisive uh, let's say the 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 dominating tactical element on the field. You know, it was still mostly about infantry, and um, and in fact that's how also ancient warfare would remain fundamentally based on. Not really, there were peoples that were all about cavalry, like the populations of the steppes. Let's say enti largely entirely that in 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 that in those environments really the the uh, the cavalry dominated by also in in the step actually the, the, there was infantry sometimes even a lot of infantry this is also often overlooked but still the the balance was in favor of cavalry um, in that case but when these populations then met the sedentary civilizations with heavy um, infantry you know at this point for many reasons still cavalry normally didn't make it uh, and um, and it had to rely in fact mostly on this uh, hit and run tactics in order to to maximize its effects right so lo let's not exaggerate also the the effectiveness um, of cavalry in general at this point in history always bearing in mind however that cavalry is one of the most devastating things you can ever meet on on the battlefield so it's not to to downsize them but just to 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 give it um, uh, a fair judgment right of its combat uh, capabilities uh, during the ancient world infantry remains the uh, reine de bataille as it's so the queen of battles it's the, that remains that and and uh the the infantry i said i hope i said <laughs> not cavalry um so and in fact the the time in history in which cavalry really had the upper hand was just a few centuries really even in the middle ages actually cavalry wasn't the the 
m for most of the Middle Ages, cavalry was not the dominant factor in battles, really. But aside from this, and I'm t saying dominant, right, to, to be specific about it. So, um, the... Um, so, talking about cataphract equipment, we here can generalize talking about a solid suit of armor. Um, probably, some people say, well, the cataphracts really didn't have a shield. Probably they had it, even if it's not so showed, but it, the, it, it could be used, definitely. And always bear in mind that, of course, the more you are armored and and the less you need a shield, really, because you know wh what do you prefer? You you're already covered in in metal, right? What do you need uh, a wooden shield for at that point? But that still can be turn uh, turn out that can still turn out useful, especially if you're not completely armored at the end of the day. Um, but smaller shields that you can't find them even among the 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 ultra heavy klebanophora uh, in the Byzantine army in the tenth century, for example. I mean, it, they they were still used and they shouldn't be underestimated. They they they're still an extra protection. If anything, on the hand that is very delicate, you need to to keep protected, um, etc. Um, armor was cataphract armor was preferably scale armor, right, that covered the cataphract, usually, in fact, from neck to knees, mm -hmm. and uh, and then a, a helmet that normally covered just the, you know, the, the head, like a, like a cap, um, but also could cover the face. Mm -hmm. um, mask helmets are present in this tradition. We have found them for example, we were discussing this in the last video I made on Roman mask helmets, you know, observing that part of this tradition was known uh, to populations like the Persians since centuries. So it's possible that the Seleucids adopted also this kind of facial uh, protection uh, and m having this sometimes even integral helmet really covered also the face. Um, this is important because also of the development that we have noticed before uh, and that we will be a bit more um, detailed now in a while uh, about the lengthening of the cavalry lengths. So the idea is that these heavier cavalries and their, their, their cavalrymen were trained to point at the face of the enemy as naturally the most lethal area, and therefore this facial protection is mask helmets were also partly designed to to prevent obviously horrendous and mortal wounds uh, on your face that could knock you out immediately right It takes a lot of training to point to aim at someone 's face during a cavalry charge, but this is what these elite troops were trained to do basically um um, and it seems, as we have seen, that horses, most of the times, were also amply protected by scale armor. Mm? In terms of offensive weapons, the cataphracts had this pike, the contos, right, um, which um, was a long, a substantially longer pike than the regular Hellenistic heavy cavalry's system, right? And in fact, the the, the system was also a pretty sizable length, but the the contos could equal uh, basically the phalangeid sarissa, right? So something that could be several meters long, right? Uh, this is important because it gives an edge to to the cavalrymen, especially during the charge. Um, so to depict the essentials here you have extensive scale armor. It's very flexible, very protective uh designed especially to protect you against projectiles. And this long spear. 
right? So this gives to cataphracts a number of advantages, especially over the enemy heavy cavalry, right? The average uh, Hellenistic heavy cavalry at that point, so the heaviest that could be fielded, normally was a partially armored guy on an unarmored unarmored horse, right? So this is much uh, the, the the cataphracts is much uh, on average much heavier. Mm -hmm. And uh, it can easily uh, have a devastating impact, even on the heaviest Hellenistic cavalry that had ever been fielded. Even the mounts, as we will see now, made a lot of difference because the the animals, the horses were much uh, more muscular, and they were their their breed was accurately selected um, for uh, uh, in fact for for that uh, for that combat style. Um, as we were saying before, armor was mostly designed to uh, cover against missiles, right? Spears and uh, so, especially pointy missiles um, against armored opponents. Usually, you want to use uh, uh, trauma, say blunt uh, weapons like, you know, slings that do not penetrate the armor, but they they still make uh, pretty heavy damage underneath it just by transferring the 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 mass uh, let's say the 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 force of the projectile is very heavy under the 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 armor that obviously under the armor this cavalrymen were protected by some padded armor of some sort it was designed in fact to absorb the the hits and to in this sense, advert further damage. Um, but most of other missiles, um, especially piercing missiles, were effectively um, neutralized by this kind of armor that um, was really the best out there um, that er had ever existed in order to stop projectiles. And it was designed, in fact, especially scale armor, in, in the steps, largely, because of that amount of arrow fire that we described before. And uh, while spears and pikes of various kind um, also gave, uh, could, could be stopped uh, in, in, in substance, you know, it's not easy to, to penetrate armor in general, even if you come very close to someone and you try to, to inflict this damage. In fact, um, as always, armored troops have always been preferably uh, taken to, 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 to the ground and then attacked with stalks or other um, uh, weapons that could penetrate the, the uncovered joints of uh, the, the, the spaces left un uncovered by the joints of the armor, right? Something like, like this. Um, and um, the um, the pike that was given to the cataphracts was also able to block the enemy advance and attack uh, at a greater distance. Always bearing in mind that cavalry is always cavalry, so uh, as an arm, by definition, cannot defend. Right? It, it cavalry is effective just in attack. If you want cavalry to be effective in defense, you have to make it dismount. And the amount of armor that these guys were covered by definitely was a pretty, uh, 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 you know, quite a big obstacle uh, for their mobility. And, and this naturally made these troops preferably used as an elite that had to be committed with a very precise tactical direction during the battle. Uh, that was mostly having this, you know, open ground where they could deliver their, their charge um, and not to tire themselves so much. So hitting straight at an enemy that was very well, you know, in, in sight and that were, uh, that could be reached without having to stop uh, with, other, with other problems. So naturally for this uh, unit, like for any other one, the cohesion during a charge was fundamental as well. Right. 
and um, it's um, it's kind of more difficult paradoxically to make um, you know the, the it, the, say the heavier the cavalry is, and the more it's difficult to adjust uh, mistakes that can happen during the, the movements, the maneuvers, right? So um, you have a limited um, set of um, situations in which you can employ these guys. Right? Usually you want to keep them in reserve, even if it's not always like that. But let's say that this should make the ones who make the ultimate charge that devastates everything. Because also w when they stop, they could be easily overwhelmed by by infantry, theoretically. So these are good as long as they can charge. Then when they stop, they can be thrown down. Look at what eventually the Roman legionaries were able to do with the Parthian cataphracts when they they stopped and you know, they charge into their lines. But as we've said before, also this wasn't in fact so frequent. Or maybe it was frequent, but it was preferably to to avoid it. All right. Uh, also, depending what your tactical needs are, because some battles can also grow inconclusive, and um, especially if you need to uh, mostly to wear the enemy out with arrows and uh, eventually hoping for the last charge. Well, it may as well be possible the conditions are such for which you cannot lead that last charge. Um, in general, we can imagine that all the advantages, however, that the cataphract cavalry had gave this man um, a great confidence that partly facilitated bolder action. We have seen at Panion that double charge that um, definitely proves a great uh, level of training, of, of effectiveness. So these were men who knew what their business were. This was kind of elite troops. Not just militarily, but also politically and socially. Um, so, um, uh, given that cataphracts attacks were generally slower, like all heavy cavalry uh, charges, than the lighter one, because it, they had to be more ordered and not to waste their energies before the, the last, usually 100 meters, when they launched into not even gallop, telling the truth, maybe counter, that is something like between 40-45 kilometers per hour, that that where is an enormous speed uh, uh, when on the field. Um, the, um, the, the, the advance gave the, the compass um, an, an enormous uh, trust uh, effectiveness that could be even higher than the one of the infantry Sarissa. Right, because the the infantryman, the phalangit is 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 idling, it's is not moving, um, while the contest arrives at you in this sense at 40, 45 kilometers per hour, and with a body mass pushing behind behind it that is of several hundreds kilos launched at that speed. So it it, it has a a massive impact. It can smash really, you know. Uh, it was said that actually up, up to the, a contest used by a cataphract could, during a charge could could spear two enemy soldiers with one thrust, right? And it's definitely physically possible, you know. So uh, always bearing in mind that at the end of the day, what made uh, cavalry charges effective, not just the the cataphract one, but all all of them, was the 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 cohesion of the formation it was not this trusting power at the end of the day, but really the ability in which you stuck together and c you could, in this sense, impress the the men in the first line so that they would give up even before um, face, uh, you know, waiting for the the impact with you. Um, naturally, uh, we have no um, evidence of um, cataphracts charging frontally. Um, phalangites because that would have been kind of suicidal there was basically no way to break a phalanx frontally and unless it didn't um, basically disrupt itself lose its cohesion maybe on a tough ground something like that but we do have some possible indirect evidence of Seleucid cataphracts especially to rout an entire Roman legion um, and later we will explain 
when and how it happened. And that's nevertheless very important because it's very rare in the ancient world to find a cavalry unit that managed to route an infantry formation after having charged it frontally. Right? So that case which happened at Magnesia really gives you the and it's very plausible also considering the number of cataphracts that were involved in that charge for for this eventuality to to take place um, and but however the the infantry phalange instead had uh, it was designed exactly like this to have this terrific defensive advantage um, also because he didn't just have his own sarissa uh, by himself but the the first line of the phalanx had in front row five more sarissae uh, before the before it uh, of the other uh, guys in the in the posterior rows that made sarissae sticking out in the fr front of the line. So you had this uh, hedgehog basically in front of you. You don't really want to charge, right? Also because, for example, and we will see it later. Not all the uh, the horse is armored. Notably, its legs are usually uh, naked, so you can make sensible damage by crippling a horse. That is also uh, horses are pretty damn tough beasts, but you know if they if you cripple them, basically they're they're good for nothing. So they're also very delicate in in, in another sense. And um, so yeah, uh, but cavalry in general was not designed at this point to charge frontally an enemy formation, especially the phalanx. So um, the uh, you can imagine the weight of this cataphract in, in general, right? Um, and scale armor I in many ways was the the best solution in this sense because th there was also plate armor, like this solid armor, just of one single cast or two major casts, you know, that, that could offer, in absolute terms, a better protection, but it was pretty damn heavy um, and could uh, hamper your movements uh, excessively, right? So scale armor was the best because you could achieve with it uh, a, a greater flexibility especially in the upper part of the body that as a cavalryman is what you're going to to move much right your your legs are still doing a terrific effort to remain um you know to 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 remain on on horseback also because here uh, stirrups are, are not really present or at least there is um there is a lot of debate not much about stirrups but how actually cataphracts were um were kept into the uh, on horseback right um and um uh, but um l let's say maybe let's speak about this mm, the the concept is that cataphracts also in these steps this is mostly observed in steps usually charged with a double hand grip uh of the contus which means that they weren't holding the bridle this is a hell of a problem because we, when you don't have stirrups and you 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 don't have even holding bridles you have pretty hard time to remain on horseback especially during the impact uh, because of, of the forces that are involved into this um, and these cataphracts were designed chiefly to charge so that was all the point of the story so there are many hypotheses of many uh, straps naturally mostly of leather and similar organic material that have been largely lost uh, archaeologically speaking that probably literally tied the horseman at his horse, right? This is really, uh, really nothing strange because it happened even during the Middle Ages, um, when stirrup was there. Um, so that of of soldiers were li literally anchored or sometimes tied to the horse, um, not to jump like away from tens of meters d after the impact, because these things really happened. Um, so. Um, it's possible that there were these very, sometimes very, also you know, uh, empirical systems to remain on horseback that, however, were effective. Always bearing in mind that the cataphract, in this sense, had a, a relatively limited employment. Um, 
right? It, it was preferably, as we've said before, kept into a situation where he had just to perform that charge that could solve the day, right? And there were exceptions to this, but that was the ideal situation. So really, the important thing was not really even to think to, to dismount in that case, but just to remain on horseback and to move a lot, chiefly with your chest, with your arms, right? Um, so, um, and, and as, as, as we've said before, all this weight brought naturally this cavalry to be filled just in, uh, in, 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 in those conditions. They, they, uh, in order to avoid the um, at disadvantages that a single isolated cataphract would face if surrounded by more agile enemies, to, to remain close in formation, close formation, very cohesive, so it was really the body mass that by itself has this deterrent force that even before the physical force uh, could make a psychological effects to create a vacuum making enemy formations collapse uh, before them. And obviously using, uh, let's say, uh, charging, advancing on a level terrain so that this cohesion could be maintained where the, the horses wouldn't get too tired a and so on. These are naturally conditions that you can't have all the time. So you have to make uh, intelligent, considerate choices in this regard. Right. And like any unit, any formation, uh, also the, the, the cataphracts uh, were vulnerable to attack from the flank in the rear, no less than the phalangites, right? This is particularly true for heavy cavalry because definitely, I don't know, uh, there were side attacks on the on the on the cataphracts, and uh, the, the single cavalryman can turn and so on. But the overall effectiveness of the formation is lost if you know your attack on the flank because you can't really change front and pretend that things work the same way uh, they, they're supposed to in, in the other direction, right? Units are very carefully deployed uh, with all a um, internal system of reliance of the individual fighters on voice in the front, voice right, voice left. If you change front, this gets re disrupted most of the times. Um, it's also complicated because the you know, it's easier to do with uh, with men that have a that while they stand, they occupy a few space, uh, but with a horse that can be more uh, like two meters long um, and more. Uh, you know, if you change front, you disrupt basically the wall formation because of the proportions. Because on the side that can occupy like one meter. Uh, usually more actually but you know if it has to turn it occupies more than two meters and you know that messes up the entire structure within so if your attack on the on the flanks and from the rear you're screwed uh, in many ways um, but this is valid really for kind of every formation and and, and naturally the the weight of this units uh, also increased the uh, how are the effect so that it was uh, it was much more difficult even to physically turn, right? So it was all very choreographed, let's say, in terms of, uh, you know, there were units that could, like horse archers, could run back and forth, they could go everywhere, etc. They didn't care much about the, the cohesion of the formation. Uh, cataphracts were obliged to, right, for the reasons that we just said. Um, and, um, in fact, as we know, what what happened also with the Romans against the, the Parthians, we know that um, such difficulties uh, that the cataphracts had were exploited by infantry units that used to to close in and to assault the cataphracts from the flanks. Right? Um, this was done by the Romans, for example, even be before waiting them to to attack, they charged them. Right? It can't sound. Uh, uh, kind of foolish, but objectively, if the unit is still not ready to charge, well, it's a pretty sensible choice. It's much better to to deal with these guys while they, they st they're they idling, because cavalry cannot defend, than wait for them to attack. You know, it is pretty, pretty 
pretty reasonable, right? Um, and uh, and as we've said before, the target, the preferred target, were the eyes, the legs below the knees, and the horse bellies, right? And this this remained a bit, a bit throughout all history. This happened also during the Middle Ages, um, that uh, you know you would, given that you were fighting against heavily armored troops, you would uh, try to to pierce them where they they were uncovered, and it was a kind of a um, obliged option, right? Because there were not many other ways to to kill at least. I mean, it's dramatically difficult to kill someone that is covered in in metal, right? And these armors were designed exactly to prevent <laughs> getting killed by hits. So that's why blunt weapons were dramatically used, uh, even by the same cataphracts that often had to meet uh, with other um, armored enemies. And therefore, maces, for example, are to be found extensively. Always remember that wherever there is a mace, um, especially metal mace, there is always metal armor. Uh, from one side or another, because otherwise you just need a cutting weapon if you're meeting unarmored opponents. Mm? But um, in this sense, the, the favorite, the, the primary, what did mace is a side weapon that you use when you you have already charged. When you're relatively, you can use it also in movement, but uh, you know. The the first weapon is the la uh, this mm, the the contest as we've seen, and always bear in mind that this lance is broke, right? So it was dramatically all th even among the infantry that pikes would break, and it also could be grabbed by the enemies, etc. Uh, it, it's not so easy to to make it through them. Uh, you sometimes you read these unlikely things like that I don't know the Romans defeated the Macedonians because they could grab the spears and pass bypass them and getting through the, it, that's not how it happened at all um, and I I dare you to, to you know uh, help you to to do that like if, if it is feasible and it is not um, so the um, but there are all these technicalities that are important to to highlight um, and however turning the pike especially you know with a phalange it is very difficult to do it like because there are so many other pikes that hit you so try to approach them that's the real problem with a cavalryman you can do it always bear in mind that it also this is kind of theoretical because not all the times you can close in the cavalryman also, the cavalryman, as we have seen, will close in as long as he thinks that he can break your formation with a charge. Otherwise, he will not charge into your front if he doesn't. If, if he thinks that uh, he, he will then have to engage into a melee, in which he, at that point he is evidently disadvantaged, right? So, let's be concrete about the all the about the fog of war, about the fact that you don't know what is going to happen most of the times, and that. Every time something different happens, so this is not like a manual tip how to do it, but you just know that sometimes it happens, right? Um, and usually, um, also this is valid for all heavy cavalry. Also, cataphracts needed the protection on their flanks. Mm -hmm. uh, usually, the protection of more mobile cavalry or infantry. Um, uh, and preferably semi-heavy units that were skilled into hand-to-hand -hand combat, for the simple reason that ideally, what, what the point is in here is that the cataphract should be left free to charge. So every other unit that gets into the way should be engaged by other lighter troops that, in this sense, um, are more mobile and can meet the enemy threat more more quickly more reactively and therefore um, you know uh, making up for that um, uh, let's say in agility that the cataphracts um, have and therefore covering their their backs literally sometimes or their flanks um, and this is pretty normal that's really how generally heavier troops even the phalanx that was the heavy infantry did they were lighter 
uh, sometimes even medium, however, uh, troops uh, on their flanks to, to protect them and to engage enemies that could attack them from, from the flank. So in many ways this was the, the phalanx of the cavalry, right? And that's the s they, they were using the same sarisai, basically, at least in terms of size. So that was the main function. Frontal action, right? These guys were not for big deal of maneuvers, just like the phalanx was, was not meant for that. Phalanx has just to go straight ahead and to have a free a level, t uh, an even terrain, and to hit the enemy, uh, having already planned wha how to walk straight towards him. Th this was, for the cra cataphracts, pretty much the, the same. Mm? And sometimes, however, it could happen that um, cataphracts could be deployed on the extreme f at the extreme flanks um, in the case uh, in case the, the some natural obstacle provided sufficient defense right so it's kind of obvious you know if there is a mountain there is a forest that you know, or, or a river and uh, you know that enemy troops are not gonna move easily in there um, so you can count on this side to be blocked for enemy passage. You say, well, but troops can't, say, cross a river, get into a forest. Well, yes, but it, that takes time. You need to disrupt the formation. Um, it's pretty difficult to to maneuver in that sense. It could even backfire. So, um, you know, all of this on the field is translated uh, in much simpler practices like I it's obvious that a, a natural obstacle is usually in fact an obstacle and that creates problems and most of the times that serves as as a sufficient defense right because it's not sensible to try to to pass it at that point because it it has intrinsic it brings to intrinsic disadvantages at that point it can be exploited by the enemy especially crossing a river uh, that's one of the most delicate moments for every unit in the first place because it's a matter of unit cohesion, it's not a matter of individual strength. Always remember this, that what matters in, in war in general is collective formations. It's collective training, it's collective order. Even if you're Rambo, if you go out of the unit, you're, you're, you, you have uh, a lot of, of power that, that is lost, right? So and that's how war is actually fought not with hyper-special individuals, with, but with pretty damn disciplined, and trained and experienced formations that work all at once, right? And believe in history, especially the ancient world, is the perfect evidence, of it, but not only, you know, every, every time of military history. You can even have the best individual um, 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 training and ability, but if you go against a trained formation, you're done. Even if those who make up for that formation are actually uh, worse than you individually, right? Um, so, um, the, um, it's possible that the limitation of the cataphracts resulted in some variation in style within the same cavalry. As we were saying before, there were probably different degrees of um, of uh, armor, um, and um, probably in some picked units of the Seleucid army, uh, the armor of the horse and the rider was less extensive. Mm -hmm. um, this obviously brings some evident advantages in mobility, that in certain special under special conditions was definitely needed. Um, in this sense, the pike could be shorter as well because it could maneuver, let's say, on let's say smaller spaces. It could make the the wall the wall combatant moving better, all right? Um, and probably also in here, certain parts of armor we know uh, from several sources could not even be made of armor pro of of metal proper. There were certain for example, leather joints. For example, um, there is evidence of some uh, plate armor in some statues, um, and and uh, we we don't really understand how they they um, 
they could bend the arm in, in some cases from from that particular ar artistic rendition and um and, and there are some authors that say that in fact part of the metal armor between the the forearm and the arm uh was was i mean were joined in fact by the uh, by a leather joint that could allow you to to bend the arm right um so naturally there were some other you know uh, types of armor you know for example the manikai in latin they're known through the latin term but i don't remember the greek one um that were anatomically designed even to even to to give this uh, flexibility but um, that's still armor Whatev whichever um, way it worked it was still heavy it was still cumbersome right so um, and you suffer while you are in an armor right this can be anatomical they can be a really uh, a masterpiece of ancient technology but still they have physical lim I mean limits that give to to the wearer and that's obvious right this is valid for every kind of unit so it's obvious that some elite, um, but let's say some regular uh, Seleucid cavalry uh, was throughout all time um, uh, at this point uh, still not full cataphract and uh, still in lighter Xistophoroi fashion, right? That was the like the ancient Alexandrian cavalry mostly, like partially armored cavalrymen in unarmored horsemen or maybe a horse sorry and uh, maybe just um, like the ala the regia ala that Levy mentions for the Seleucid army at Bagnesia it could be I don't know maybe a chest armor for the horse like even in fact the the older Macedonian cavalry had had right so it, it's pretty normal at this point and um, the it it it's possible though that there could be some plate armor for horses as well. Could be interesting. In 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 um in in, in other cases in, instead there could be a scale armor for the I mean armor for the horsemen alone, as we said before. So all combinations that at that point depended even on the individual cavalrymen really, or just on the availability of armor in general in the army. So uh, that really depends. So we would probably be surprised by the lack of homogeneity in this type of equipment. And still, uh, I think uh, everything is uh, functional. Uh, it, it didn't really make a big deal of, of difference. Also because when you... Um, you know, sometimes you just have to make mass. I mean, I, within a formation, usually it's always in, in the very first row that is better armored because it has to sustain the heavier blow. Sometimes you even can bluff a little and put in the l in the posterior rows uh, less armored people so that, that the enemy thinks that they are still that they are armored just like the guys in the first row that they can't s uh, actually see in detail because they, they can't see there there's someone behind but they can't distinguish well so these are tricks that were done all the time. Even the phalanx was segmented like this, like the, the best armored troops were the one in the front because they had also to absorb all the projectiles, etc. So it's possible that in the, the, the cavalry units it was exactly the same way. I, at the famous Daphne parade of 166 BC, Antiochus IV, Seleucid regular cavalry, counted 4,500 troops. 1,000 of whom belonged to the Agema, right? Which was the guard, the cavalry guard, recruited in Media. Hmm? So Media was this region of the Middle East um, that was famous from, uh, for its uh, cavalry. Um, the same um, Achaemenid rulers ha were Meds, originally speaking. So these were Iranic populations that had come straight from the steppes and in this particular environment had maintained uh, this, uh, the, the greatest uh, cavalry tradition that could be found at this point in the Seleucid ruled uh, lands. Um, and there is strong reason to suggest that, uh, in fact, this cavalry 
uh, was the uh, let's say the model the local model on which upon which part of the Seleucid cavalry that made up the cataphracts was was uh, built up and also part of the area in which uh, actually s Macedon military colonists had settled since Alexander's campaign where the Seleucids had reinforced this uh, say the, the continuity of cavalry cavalry traditions in fact Apameia had uh, the was a city in Media had the royal stables of the empire and um, so th this area was definitely uh, very important for cavalry and the uh, the cavalry guard um, of the Agama was recruited in here as we have just said um, and uh, f for this reason we can count that uh, out of this 4500 cavalry 1000 was the the elite right partly basically cataphract while the rest of the cavalry was recruited of 3500 cavalry was recruited from Syria and Mesopotamia alone which is not few um, this was all pretty good cavalry not just runaway light skirmishers Th these were the regular Seleucid cavalry the rest of Seleucid cavalry was fielded usually by tributary uh, populations, allies, um, etc. So, and as you know, the Near and Middle East uh, really populated of all this um, light cavalry men that were typical of the local local warfare. So, th the Seleucids in this sense w never ran out of, of of lighter cavalry. What they really cared was was having this from medium to heavy. Uh, regular cavalry that could make most of of uh, of the job on, on the field in terms of shock power, right? And so um, this, the rest of this cavalry would, however, include partly like twenty five hundred cataphracts and so called Nizans, according to these sources. Now. Uh, the, the Nisan plains uh, are at the foot of the southern region of the Zagros Mountains in, in Iran, right? Um, and all these troops were um, military settlers who uh, had adopted probably the heavy armor in the Median style that wasn't really the full cataphract one. It was a halfway, like it was some of the uh, heavier cavalry uh, armor type probably slightly heavier than what the original Macedonian cavalry of Alexander the Great had been and it's still a region was in contact with th this Iranic equestrian uh, tradition um, of the steppes. In fact Nisan horses were also this, this uh, very tough horse breed that was pretty also big, right? It, it was um, bred exactly to to provide uh, the the material for heavy shock cavalry. So we have also the uh, so this is about the the, the Daphne parade is um, famous also for other reasons, also because ha we have evidence of some equipment, etc. But this gives you this is a good example to give you a bit of a segmentation how the, this cavalry was recruited, etc. Uh, the most important uh, mention of Seleucid cataphracts is, however, at the Battle of Magnesia or Magnesia, if you prefer, 190 BC. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the source is Livy, um, Livy 37 40 from 5 to 11 that in this sense doesn't qualify it says uh, cataphracts point end of the story with any other qualification um, and this is important because um, this is in, in this mm, uh, stance Levy makes a list of all the Seleucid cavalry contingents uh, fielded uh, that day um, better the 
the, the cavalry under uh, Antiochus the third on that battle and aside from Seleucid regulars there were also the uh, let's say national cavalry contingents coming from all those other tributary populations of the empire so Livy distinguishes the cataphracts from this other cavalry contingents which the idea is that, that this 6,000 cataphracts were Seleucids proper right 6,000 6,000 is an enormous number right normally you would think well it may be a, by the way it could be an exaggeration because if you count really all the troops that are um, uh, in Seleucid army according to Livy that they're a, a very great many so th probably there were much less especially if they were full cataphracts right um, nevertheless um, this number shouldn't be just dismissed and um, as always that that's at least how I tend to interpret things uh, you know if if this author wrote 600 uh, I mean 6,000 cataphracts well it still means that it was a pretty large number of cataphracts for the normal like indeed of all the sources we have this was the uh, the larger number of cataphracts ever fielded um, and uh, considering also that we estimate um, the Seleucid regular cavalry at this point having been be something between like eight, something eight like eight thousand. Let's let's put it in this number. Um, it's very important because cataphracts are also deployed on both wings of the Seleucid army, so there was plenty of them. But usually, an elite uh, unit uh, is not really so um, I it's really plausible that th there was a really a larger number of them so many in fact they could be even split in two wings uh, what is interesting is that um, Polybius uh, referring to the Daphne parade also enumerates Denizans among the, uh, the, the the various national contingents so it's as if there was a, a split between the Seleucid regulars and the Nizans that apparently were the like the best um, cavalrymen, whether they were locals, but some were probably a mix between the, the, the Seleucid colonists and the um, this this national, I mean, local contingents, um, and therefore, uh, like say separating the two things. Why you would think that the the Seleucids at this point through this the, the process of um, adoption integration of uh, heavier cavalry would uh, have somewhat absorbed that area fully and maybe having made of it the base of their their cavalry uh, uh, disposability so um, in, in this especially in the case of Polybius that by the way is, is Polybius 30 25 6 as a reference, um, the term Nizan shouldn't be uh, considered really as a nationality proper, but rather by uh, a style of warfare and equipment that was typical of the uh, horses of this Median breed, right? And and therefore they could be regarded, they should be regarded, in my opinion, uh, as also Barkotba says. Um, like the cataphracts as regulars mm. so these are big the ambiguities that sources give that we have no certainty about but can be framed a little bit uh, in this sense um, so there is general consensus among um, historians that um, the as we were saying at the beginning of the video that Antiochus the third had transformed his regular cavalry into cataphracts uh, after becoming acquainted with uh, this type of, of, of horsemen in the course of his invasion of Parthia between 210 and 206 BC um, there is um, some uh, idea in fact that um, as we said before all of the Seleucid regular cavalry 
was um, transformed in some sort of heavily armored cavalry after this uh, this episode. Uh, the evidence to support this would derive from the development of from the employ the, the modalities of employment of Seleucid heavy cavalry during um, the battles of Panion and of Magnesia. The companions, the Etairoi, um, uh, of the Seleucid army were deployed in the center at the Battle of Panion. Um, if you want the reference, this is um, Polybius 16, 18, 7. You know that the companions were basically the elite cavalry of the Hellenistic um, armies. They remembered the ancient, uh, mm, let's say, brotherhood of the Macedonian aristocracy that was found of, of horses and fought, in fact, on horseback. So the Etairoi, these were really uh, considered as the, uh, the, the ultra-elite, right? So basically what this helps is, uh, but as, as we've said before, the, the best the Macedonians could feel at that time was a, a only a partly armored cavalry. Right, um, not a fully armored one, um, but putting this cavalry in the center at Panion, it seems that you know, yeah, it was a pretty sizable chunk in that battle. But it also means that it had this even shock effect, and this possibly corresponds to the um, to really the idea that there were ultra heavy cavalry, um, and the same goes for the Agema that is opposed to uh, uh, placed opposite to, uh, into, uh, to a Roman legion in the Battle of Magnesia. Um, so this has led to historians to believe that the guard contingents of the Seleucid army had been turned by this point in some sort of cataphracts as well, mm? which traditionally they had not been. Um, and uh, yet, they, they they weren't full armored, um, because, for example, the companions of the Battle of Magnesia are defined by Levi as uh, with lighter armor for themselves and their horses, but otherwise with the equipment not unlike the rest. That is the cataphracts that the Levi has just mentioned before. Uh, for the reference, this is always Levi thirty-seven forty eleven, right? Um, so this is important because it's some Levy basically takes at this point the cataphracts as the uh, the reference point in order to describe the companions, which should have been theoretically like the, the most uh, the most important, the most prestigious unit, right? Instead, now the companions are defined in relation to the cataphracts, right? And and um, and, and observing that they weren't really differently armored, like they were another kind of the cataphracts. Were, they were lighter compared to the cataphracts, right? It says, but otherwise with equipment not unlike the rest. So these were al also probably pretty heavily armored as well. Um, and given that we're talking about the Seleucids properly, we this has led to suggest that this type of let's say, lighter version of cataphracts was, in fact, heavier than the ordinary Hellenistic, uh, Hellenistic Xistophoroi horsemen, right? Um, um, we don't, basically, we don't know anything else um, about the equipment of Seleucid cataphracts and companions at the Battle of Magnesia, nor the one of Panion. Um, and so we don't truly really know, for example, what I mean, how long their spears were, or how uh, heavy or sizable their armor was. We know nothing, right? Um, so um, the, the, the there are just speculations. Most, at least, Barkochva in this. Um, in this case, believes, however, that this type of ca of cavalry in this particular context of Seleucid army of the first, very first, second century, century BC was not as heavy as 
for example, the Sarmatian cataphracts of, of the second century AD. They're a bit of typical this uh, Alan uh, horsemen covered from feet to toe with uh, with a scale armor. There are horses as well, and I think it's it's right in, because in part, I mean, we can reason by analogy. For example, um, for example, Persian Persian cavalry transformed over time. The Parthian cataphracts that arrive in here in the, the third and second century BC in the, the in this lands of the Iranian plateau from Parthia bring together with them this ultra heavy cataphract tradition that however in the same in the Sassanid period after well after basically uh, 400 years um, or more actually half of a millennium um, they tend to get lighter towards the end of the Sassanid period like uh, the Sassanids probably maintained some in some case cases especially from certain Parthian clans kind of full cataphracts between the 3rd and 4th century AD but then from this the, the, fi the 5th to the 7th actually we know that uh, there were some military reforms that brought Persian cavalry to be lighter uh, half armored uh, maybe the, the the actually the the cavalrymen appear at least the, the most elite ones as fully armored but the horses armored only in, in the front like in the first half of the horse the frontal half of the horse from the belly up let's say um, so yes it, it, this means that basically sedentary cavalrys that try to emulate the cataphracts tend not to be so effective like those populations that actually originate and originated this combat style this happens a bit also for the Romans. For example, the Romans uh, at one point copy um, these uh, cataphracts, chiefly from the, the Parthians and the Sarmatians, because uh, in this period the Romans fight against, for example, Seleucid uh, cataphracts that are a bit of an exception here, and we have no knowledge of Romans copying cataphracts. It starts mostly from the first century AD. Um, but Roman cataphracts are renownedly uh, a disaster. Like most of the times they were employed, they performed very poorly. They were defeated very easily. So actually, um, there were other types types of cavalry that were more effective at the end of the day. And always bear in mind that. And why does this happen? Well, this happens. Be so, by the way, to conclude the thought. So also, Seleucid cataphracts were not just like the true. Central Asian cataphracts, right? They were a copy that somewhat uh, w was reasonably and effectively integrated, um, as we have seen before, but that probably wasn't really as heavily armored or as that um, Central Asian model, right? And the reason being that objectively, I mean, covering yourself from foot to, like, from head to, to toe is you know especially in uh, mediterranean warfare at this point of view, like european or mediterranean warfare it's not really needed because there is not all that arrow fire that you find in the steppe for example so yeah it's, it's ancient battlefields had bullets flying in crossing the hair all the time like slingshots uh, arrows javelins etc but it, w it wasn't as uh, intense like horse archery fire so uh, the uh, that's why also for ex for example the romans tend to heavier their armor uh, over time in part uh, this is also very controversial as a statement um, um, and it, um, let's say having the armor is not the uh, the unique solution for coping with a lot of hard of fire actually but obviously it helps if you at least if you have the available resources always bear in mind that also being armored does have a cost also on the agility of the battlefield so you may actually sacrifice even your tactical mobility in some occasions where that would be better to have uh, instead than, than, than protection physical protection um, so at the end of the day, we know that very few about Seleucid cataphracts uh, equipment, and we can't add much more, right? Um, the um, relatively to the Battle of Panion, 
there's not much to add that we already didn't mention before. Um, we just remember that basically Seleucid cavalry w won the battle. I mean, proved somewhat decisive at the end of the day because um, the battle was decisive, in fact, by the success of the Seleucid right wing in the northern arena of the battlefield, and um, they, uh, the Seleucid cataphracts, uh, swept away the Italian cavalry that. Um, um, that was on the Seleucid, uh, excuse me, on the Ptolemaic uh, left wing, and then they, uh, the Seleucid cataphracts, come back to take the Ptolemaic phalanx from the rear, mm? and that is really uh, like, as you know, when when the phalanx loses protection from the phalanx in the rear, it's it's done for, right? There's nothing they can do, so the battle is won in that way. Magnesia is more interesting because the Seleucids lose the battle famously, and partly it has to do with cavalry. But actually, cataphracts also in here perform greatly, as much as we know. Um, there's a bit of, of, of debate on how the battle really went, uh, because there are some later sources that appear kind of more reasonable than the, say, the ancient, the, the more ancient ones, and theoretically more reliable ones. There is probably some ideological reason, now we will see how. Basically, um, Magnesia is uh, fairly easy... I mean, it, it's it's a well-documented battle for the time. In the general uh, course of the battle, despite some considerable gaps, it's rather clear, right? And much has to do with... Um, now we can't tell the story of the battle. W one day we'll make you the, the history of Magnesia, uh, but we don't have time now. Um, there is a problem, though, that basically at a certain point, um, Antiochus, um, right, um, charges the the Roman left flank, and we don't know actually who they really charged. There is one source that is Appian that recounts that the right wing cavalry was probably the Agema, so the elite, the cavalry guard, the Seleucid army, and the cataphracts altogether mm, charged um, and broke through the line of the Roman phalanx. Now, I'll explain you what, what it, that means. So, first of all, this is important because in, in the um, Seleucid right wing. There were also other uh, units, notably the, the Dahai, that were actually uh, uh, an Iranic tribe akin to the Parthians, that was mostly famous for, for its light cavalry, but probably wasn't that different also for the Parthians, mean, meaning that its elite probably fought as cataphracts. But there is no, like, in, in military history, the Dahai are remembered mostly for their light cavalry, so here there is no evidence that either the I mean, that's not really important. The important thing here is that in the r Seleucid right wing there was the elite, the cavalry guard and the cataphracts, right? So Appian writes uh, in Greek, so um, he, um, he writes that the line of the, uh, the, 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 right, the the Seleucid right breaks through the line of the Roman phalanx, right? Here the term phalanx is very important just en passant if you ever meet uh, this term in the sources, when the Greeks write um, phalanx, they don't actually mean, and that's why you don't have to take these words as scientific categorization, they don't mean th the Hellenic phalanxes, like the one of the of classical Greece or the uh, this Macedonian style phalanx, right? By phalanx, the Greeks define basically and generically every kind of basically heavy infantry in a kind of a not necessarily in a thickly packed formation but uh, consequently it, it, it defines that meaning that all heavy infantry usually fights like that so basically the the the, the, the Greeks call phalanx Carthaginian infantry Carthaginian heavy infantry Roman infantry Celtic infantry so there is really uh, you don't. You don't have to think for this reason that Carthaginians had a phalanx. 
no, the Carthaginians didn't have a phalanx, just just know it. Connolly mistranslated the term long ke, which is a lo is a javelin, not a not a not a pike. And all people believe now the Carthaginians copied the Hellenistic phalanxes, and no, they hadn't their army reorganized, reformed by Hellenic advisors to be transformed into a phalanx. That's not how it worked. It wasn't like that. So end of the story. And I will be more precise in other occasions, but do not think that f uh, Hellenic and Hellenistic phalanxes were rep replicated or replicable even more elsewhere. Be very co uh, careful about this. This is something you never hear because nobody talks about this, but it, it's of dramatic importance because otherwise you can't properly understand and even phalanx warfare for what it, it was. And this tells us so much about the superficiality of how we treat these topics. But aside from this, uh, so here the Roman phalanx is meant to be uh, the legions, like the, the heavy infantry. Now, Levi um, tells another story. Um, now, the, the point is that um, according to him, uh, Antiochus first of all commanded the world right wing this is Levi 35, 41, 1. Um, and he states that Antiochus uses the, used the cataphracts and the auxiliaries. Hmm? So the Dahai could fit into that as well, but we don't really know. Um, according to their location, uh, probably um, this was the, the cavalry guard. Uh, to charge the Roman cavalry that was near the river uh, that was on the Roman left flank, both uh, by a frontal attack and with an outflanking movement, basically routing this tiny Roman cavalry force and 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 part of the adjacent infantry. This is Levy forty two. 7 to 8. So what happens according to, to Levy is that the wall Seleucid right wing charges the Roman Turmai in pronunciatio restituta otherwise Turmai if you prefer the Turmai were like 120 horses there were very few cavalry that existed into the Roman um, to the Roman legions. This is Levy saying this. So and and what happens is that basically the enormous Seleucid right wing overwhelms this Roman Turmai of 120 cavalrymen and then partly breaks um, uh, part of the adjacent legionary infantry uh, both frontally and in part kind of outflanking it. This, this doesn't sound right. Um, for many reasons. Um, first of all, um, the total right wing, um, Seleucid right wing in this context would have been something like 3,000 cataphracts and 1,000 uh, guardsmen. So, and 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 plus, according to Livy, the auxiliaries that is the other 1,200 dahai, right? So basically, something like. Um, 6,200 cavalrymen, some of which are the finest of uh, of the ancient world, literally, to do what? To break a force of 120 Roman horses. This doesn't quite make sense. Think al about spaces, first of all. You know, uh, the cataphracts uh, in the Seleucid right wing were, in, if I'm not wrong, in the most internal size, that is closer to the center. So in order to attack this 120 horsemen on the extreme left of the um, of the Roman uh, of the Roman army, they would have necessarily had to move at least diagonally towards them because in the front they would have had other Roman infantry, presumably. So basically, this huge amount of of cavalry, right? I repeat, six. Uh, 6,200 cavalry that can be exaggerated but still you know in front of 120 is yeah uh, 
doesn't quite make a lot of sense, right? Roman cavalry at this point was like uh, Roman legionary cavalry was uh, basically medium cavalry. It was more or less the equivalent of the Xistophoroi, maybe even less um, in terms especially of shock power. But um, that's pretty much it. So you don't move, uh, you know, something that is like five, uh, fifty times more powerful, like to, to fight fifty to one. For for what exactly? Uh, committing all these the, the elite troops to wipe out that tiny force doesn't make freaking sense. There is a problem also of space of deployment. According to Levy, well, if you count his numbers, this Seleucid army was something enormous, like also implausibly big. Um, so, um, and even assuming that this had been the case, the Seleucid cataphracts moving diagonally would have, at that point, uh, created a gap, a, a very dangerous gap, into um, the, the basically just next to their own phalanx, right? So it's as if the, you know, the, the legionary, the, the Roman uh, troops that were in the front of the cataphracts now had basically seen the, the cataphracts all shift on the flank to attack their extreme left, and basically, this Roman infantry would have found a gap among, you know, the Seleucid line on the fl on side of the phalanx to exploit so easily. Um, it's it's kind of absurd. So there is Justin's version that actually is, is the most interesting, and uh, actually is probably right, even though we are still in the realm of hypothesis. Um, Justin says that Antiochus III charged the Roman legion that was posted opposite his right flank and routed it. So this is actually much more plausible because it's very plausible that at this point cataphracts had Roman infantry in the front of them, uh, an entire legion in this case, and that he used the cataphracts to wipe them out. Is it realistic? Why not? I mean, um, a Roman legion didn't have the frontal stopping power of a Macedonian phalanx. Uh, they were actually kind of, at this point, medium infantry, especially the first ranks, if they were usually deployed with the triplex Achias uh, order that would have been made of the Astati, who were basically uh, even less than medium infantry, actually kind of light infantry. But by the beginning of the 3rd century BC, actually, this, even one century before the Marian reform, actually, especially during the Second Punic War, the, the three Roman um, Achaeus had basically blended in. That basically, the average Roman legionnaire here, that there was the, the, the internal section in terms of, of uh, administrative repartition, but the troops were now all pretty homogeneous well before the Roman re uh, Marian reform um, that just basically sanctioned the thing fo formally. Um, so there were maybe medium infantry like on the Principes style with the Lodicamata and the helmet, the, sh the scutum, etc. So yeah, there probably were something like that. But they, quite, they didn't have pikes, they didn't, they didn't have weapons that were pretty much designed to stop um, uh, to stop, uh, basically, the, the heaviest cavalry charge they could find out there. Um, there were also kind of a, um, unprofessional militias still, despite some of them might have been veterans from further, firmer uh, conflicts. Uh, but it's possible that such a big number, like 3,000 cataphracts, let's assume, the half of the cataphracts that were there, could have effectively broken an entire Roman legion at this point. Uh, there would be nothing strange about it, really. Uh, the Roman legion didn't count, uh, at this point, more than uh, 3,600. So, against 3,000 cataphracts, will might have been broken easily. So, this, is, this might have occurred, and Levy might have wanted to obscure this 
um, definitely Justin's account is more reliable than than Levy's one, at least in terms of military logics, right? So uh, it's, it's kind of plausible. The guard and the cataphracts confront the left Roman legion, and uh, this uh, head-on charge sounds reasonable since uh, the the cataphracts were well enough equipped to overcome the legion from the front. Uh, but it, it, it's still exceptional, meaning that, as we said before, it was normal. It was not normal for in ancient warfare to have cavalry charging infantry frontally and defeating it. Normally, cavalry operated from from the flanks to attack from the flank or from the rear. Right. This is instead explicitly fl a frontal attack, um, and it's basically the only time I, I, I record this, like, uh, especially with against infantry of a certain consistency, like the Roman legions were at this point yes, uh, already, uh, by certain standards, you know, the, that the, this was not so easy, and, and the number helps, because if the cataphracts were really so many, which is probably an exaggeration, but, you know, they had a shock power that could wipe out the number of, uh, of Roman legionnaires um, so um, it's you know the the total collapse of a Roman legion was quite rare at the time so and by the way Justin writes it uh, about it as a disgrace um, um, and um, the the point is that um, there um, Justin is using another source that um, uh, that is Pompeius Trogus, right? And these sources were, you know, fairly acquainted to nat I mean, to Roman history, well uh, enough, well enough acquainted to Roman history not to confuse, for example, um, the, uh, for example, the extreme Latin ala with the adjacent adjacent Roman legion, right? Um, and um, Levy might have simply wanted to obscure this because this sounded definitely as a calamity. Uh, eventually, the Romans did win the Battle of Magnesia for real, um, and um, so this could be taken out of the account because you know it didn't quite sound right for a source that wanted to celebrate Roman valor, uh, etc. You know, the, the defeat of an entire legion is is a deep thing. You know, we can't understand it today with our modern secular standards, but it was a, a deep religious thing, you know, why would a Roman legion fall into a battle like that, in which the Romans even won at the end, so um, Levy might have obscured partly um, the, the this side of the story, right, and um, it, it might be that Polybius, for example, uh, not making clear the distinction between the legions and the ally in the course of his narrative um, um, might have influenced the thing and um, the it, it's also might be uh, I don't know that basically Polybius if I'm not really Polybius doesn't uh, it misses the end the, the, there is it's fragmentary the battle of Magnesia for him so um, in his account so um, Maybe, I don't know, um, they got confused because they might have portrayed the onslaught of the Dahai um, cavalry on, on the Turmai, for example. Um, it's possible like this, because, by the way, consider that at the time, uh, I didn't say this, the difference between the Legion and the Ala was that fundamentally, uh, like, the, the Roman Ally were later on, at the time of Levi, let's say, um, cavalry units. In, in the 3rd century BC they weren't like that. The ally consisted um, of, of infantry and um, cavalry alike because they basically were the, the allied equivalent of the Roman citizen legion. So maybe Levi got confused, it's possible, um, so that he thought that the, the ally here meant the the uh, Roman cavalry, the small Roman cavalry contingent of each legion on the flank, right? So he confused the two things, not 
uh, remembering, but you should check whether Levy describes, for example, the ancient uh, allied ally, for example, to understand better. Um, anyhow, um, all what we know, though, is that seemingly cataphracts achieved a, a m from kind of a good to a excellent result in this battle at least on the right wing of the Seleucid army. What happened on the left flank was was a mess instead. It was not the cataphracts' fault, poor cataphracts. Uh, what happens on the Seleucid left flank is basically that the attack of uh, the Seleucids was, was started by the chariots, uh, seated chariots, and on, on the Roman right wing there were the um, the the Hellenistic allies that had the Italids that had coped already with war chariots in the east and they knew how to cope with them so basically the Italids sent, sent this um, skirmish cavalry against the uh, Seleucid cavalry and they start harassing them with javelins and the um, the horses start running uh, the, the Seleucid horses of the Seleucid chariots start running amok um, because of the arrows and, and other missiles directed at them. Um, so um, these were, by the way, I'm, I don't know if I remember correctly if they were the same at Talbot. They were Cretans and Trallians performing this uh, missile fire against the, the Seleucid chariots. Um, anyhow, the, the crippled horses of the Seleucid chariots turned back to their own line. And and uh, basically, through the cataphracts that were deployed uh, behind them into utter confusion. So this really messes up the thing. This is dramatic. That it's not much that the cataphracts could do at that point. There were lots of chariots, so it's perfectly plausible. Also with the uh, sides that um, they started cutting the horses' legs. I mean, they threw them into confusion. And as we've seen before, disorder, confusion is you know, disrupts the, the formation, the cohesion, and that's it. So, um, at this point, the Seleucid heavy cavalry uh, suffers considerable losses from their own chariots and, and cannot do anything about it. Um, they retreat because they realize that they cannot cope with the enemy in the front of them because now they're, they're disrupted. And um, as a consequence, um, the 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 rest of the Seleucid left wing, with all the other cavalry that composed it, collapses entirely. And this is interesting because I don't know if you remember how Mag Magnesia goes. Basically, the right um, Seleucid wing reaches the enemy camp, the Roman camp, and they get repelled. There is no specific mentions of ca uh, cataphracts. Basically. They are able to disengage and come back on the field. But in the meanwhile, what has happened is that the Seleucid left uh, wing is um, routed, as we've seen. The Seleucid phalanx remains without flank support. So what they do before getting uh, enclosed by the Roman um, and Italian cavalry is they form uh, a square. Um, they put even the elephants in the, in the center and uh, eventually it collapses by itself, chiefly because of the elephants, seemingly, that were pretty disturbed by the situation. And uh, and therefore, when basically the Seleucid right wing, Sele Seleucid cavalry comes back on the field, they find that everybody's dead <laughs> already, so it's, that's how basically the Seleucids lost it. But uh, just this was just an example to say how things can go wrong in spite that you have the best um, troops available and actually even the phalanx was a pretty amazing machine because that's like the first time you, you see uh, a phalanx capable of performing uh, of reforming as a, as a as a square in during combat like uh, the phalanx normally you know once they the, the flank was lost routed immediate broken and 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 fled instead these guys that were veterans of Antiochus the third um, managed to to carry out this maneuver that is outstanding and um, 
eventually they, they, they lose because the situation was evidently against the odds were against them but um, that's that also tells you how um, you know effective actually both um, Seleucid cavalry and um, and, and, and pikemen were and infantry were at this point uh, the regulars properly so but this is a battle when you really find the finest deployed but it actually loses it because um, because of, of bad luck essentially and uh, and also some other defects that we, we can't talk about the Battle of Magnesia. Battle of Magnesia is one of my favorite battles <laughs> in absolute terms there is so much to, to, to tell about it but you can't do it now um, um, always however th this is important to remember always think that these stories are largely like we rely on these sources but we know how easily this could have distorted the outcome of, of the battle like what happened at Magnesia even assuming that Justin was right right uh, that the most plausible version this still doesn't tell us what actually happened like it's a militarily logical battle uh, account from the one we can uh, recompose but still what to hell what the hell do we know about battle of the battle of the second century BC we weren't there we'll never be there unfortunately and uh, we all have these accounts point end of the story is it valid to say this is what happened on that battlefield no uh, we don't know what happened we will never do it okay so um, I would hand it here and um, there will be a lot to say like uh, even in terms of Seleucid cavalry but we will do it on another time th on another occasion this was, this was really about Seleucid cataphracts um, that are the ultra elite of the Seleucid army and uh, maybe in another video we will actually look more thoroughly about other types of cavalry I definitely will make a video for each type of cavalry that we know um, and uh, and also about the cavalry organization and its recruitment and where these guys came from and so on uh, today I said something about it but it I mean the video was not really about this the, the video was mostly about telling what was a cataphract of the second century BC in the Seleucid army that that's pretty much it um, so for now I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye